The Aztec Empire had long appreciated the rich, fertile lands belonging to the Huastec peoples, a Mayan offshoot that had settled in Mexico's northern Gulf Coast by 1800 BC. The Aztecs were eager to conquer the Huasteca because they knew how much this subtropical region could produce. And in this video, we will see how they wrote in pictures to detail and even count their demands once they came to control it. Hello, if you are new to Eye of the Serpent, welcome. The channel looks at Native American thought and culture from ancient to modern times. The current playlist on Native writing systems picks up from the last episode, introducing the Codex Mendoza as an exemplar of Aztec script, expressing specific ideas and even sounds through a conventional set of images. As we begin, it is important to distinguish between two types of pictures, pictographs and glyphs. In the context of Aztec writing, we may refer to pictographs as images depicting specific things such as people and objects. Glyphs, on the other hand, are abstract images symbolizing concepts, sounds, or other communicated signs. Aztec writing readily combined the two styles, as cases from the Codex Mendoza will show in this episode. As the previous installment focused on the chronicles of the Mexica Aztec emperors, the Tlatoque, this episode will delve into illustrations in the Codex Mendoza sections on provincial tribute and social activity. If you watched the previous installment, you may remember that it ended with a glimpse of the city of Tuxpan, Veracruz. Named after the Nahuatl Tochpan on the rabbit, its glyph appeared among the conquests of Ashayacat, sixth Tlatuani Emperor of the Mexica. The second section of the Codex Mendoza is a list of the tributes demanded from the Aztec Empire's conquered lands. After Ashayacat secured the Huasteca for Mexica control, the Aztecs could begin to prescribe the exact tribute amounts expected from those lands. Each set of pages in the second section of the Codex Mendoza follows the patterns appearing in this case for the Huasteca. While the Aztec emperors had extensive tribute list archives, the Codex Mendoza has the best preserved example of how they could have looked. To identify the main communities of the given region, most of their images are drawn in a descending column at left margin. As Tochpan became the head city for the imperial province, it is the first community for the list. This image, by the way, is another example of the Rebus principle introduced in the last episode. The glyphs represent specific sets of sounds in the Nahuatl language. Tochtli for rabbit and Panit for flag are combined to read Tochpan. Another noteworthy glyph in this set is forth from the top, a white banner for Papantla, a city in central Veracruz famous today for the voladores performances of the native Totonac. Because the Huasteca region could be farmed for abundant crops, the Mexica prioritized them for tribute. The preponderance of cloths in various designs is evidence of a massive cotton industry, diverted to fuel the empire. The Mexica were demanding not only a wealth of cotton mantles, called Quachtli, but also a variety of specific designs among them, including colored bands and intricate decorations. At center right are two bales of chili, marked with the red peppers on top. How much were the exact tributes then? The glyphs encode numeric amounts after the base 20 or vigesimal counting system used in the Nahuatl language. In the Codex Mendoza, a dot or finger stood for one item or a unit of measurement from 1 to 19. Here we see fingers used to count the number of lengths each cut and sheet should span per set. A few items on this page have small flags, the unit for 20, Sempo Wali. So if we take the example of the sheets with red pigment and conch seashell design, we find four flags. What is four times 20? The Mexica Aztecs were expecting 80 sheets in this design. Returning to the bales of chili, each has a small feather at top, marking the unit of 20 times 20, a count of 400, sensuntli. How many bales of chili are counted on this page then? What is 2 times 400? 800 is correct. Every Mesoamerican language counted by multiples of 20. The full military outfits and shields at lower left were a common tribute from almost every province in the list. These helped supply the Mexica military so that they could go out and conquer more lands. So, what kinds of materials were the Mexica Aztecs demanding from their imperial subjects? It depended on what each region could produce. 
The Spanish were in fact aware of this economy and they may have commissioned the production of this tribute list so that colonists could learn what resources were available across the former empire. This page has a few interesting features. It was made for the province headed by the city of Tochtepec at the Rabbit Mountain, whose image we find at upper left, much like the Tochpan example from the last page. This region is in southern Mexico, between the states of Veracruz and Oaxaca. Notice that there is almost no food in this list of local resources, but rather an abundance of gold, jade, and other precious materials for jewelry. At lower right, we find two rubber balls, which would have been used for the famous ball game. Below each is a priest's bag of incense, which represented the next counting unit after 400. 400 times 20 is 8,000, Shikipili. What is 2 times 8,000? The Mexica wanted 16,000 rubber balls from the Tochtepec province. The Xoconochco province, along the Pacific coast of what is now the land between Chiapas and Guatemala, was hotly contested for control between the Aztecs and the Quiche Maya. At the very top of the page are glyphs representing the Aztec festivals of Ochpanistli, with a broom for cleansing rites, and Tlaca Xipe Walistli, featuring the headdress of Xipe Totegu, to whom sacrifices would be offered. Each of these periods lasted a 20-day month, a way to mark off the times for tribute collection. Fitting for the tropical zone, the demands included bundles of colorful plumage, bills of cacao beans, and even stacks of jaguar pelts. We now turn to the third and final section of the Codex Mendoza on social life in the Aztec world. Beginning with the birth of the new Aztec child, the section chronologically presents lifetime milestones as the person grows into man or womanhood. This is a unique subject in the surviving literature from the Aztec civilization. It is therefore a valuable source text on how the Aztecs regarded their own places in society. Socializing the Aztec infants came within days of birth. Like the solid lines linking people to places and times from the last episode, the dotted lines mark progression. The newborn, appearing first in a crib at left, is given four days, marked by the colored rosettes, which usually stand for 20-day periods. After the four days, an elderly midwife carries the infant around a pot of water over a mat. Depending on its gender, it will be given miniature instruments representing their destiny. Crafts and warfare for the boy, cleansing and weaving for the girl. With speech scrolls issuing from their mouths, the three boys at right ceremonially name the child. The parents, at left, then take their child to the temple for priestly blessings. The children begin to mature. As mentioned earlier in this episode, dots were a common way to count from 1 to 19, before the flag used for a unit of 20. Here they count the child's age and years, such as the three dots for the boy with his father, at left, and the girl with her mother, at right. They have started wearing clothes, and their daily diet was half a tortilla. By the age of four, they could begin performing chores, and they could eat a whole tortilla per day. Between five and six, the children became more productive, taking wares to the marketplace or spinning cotton into thread. The Aztecs were also infamous for corporal punishment, and among their most notorious disciplinary measures for an unruly child was holding their face over the choking, irritating fumes of burning chili peppers. A miscreant boy could also be forced to lay on bare dirt with his hands bound, or a girl would be sent to clean in the dark of night. An incorrigible child may even be sold into slavery until they worked off the payment. But these were exceptional cases. The same page follows with better comported teenagers, becoming able workers as they haul goods, make tortillas, catch fish, and weave cloths. They also continued to develop in their professions, which were often hereditary. Here we see an Aztec Tlaquilo scribe teaching his son the arts of writing through pictures to create works such as murals and codices. The small curl design is in fact an Aztec glyph for writing. And when they came of age, they were ready for two landmark events, education and marriage. The Aztecs were the first society in the New World known to offer public education. The schools included the priestly Calmecac and the military Telpochcali. Footprints indicate trajectory here toward the schools and to the mat where the young man and woman would hold their wedding. This scene is one of the most celebrated from the Codex Mendoza. 
Seated on the mat in the house center, a knot between the newlyweds' clothes symbolizes their union. At the corners are elders delivering wewe tlatoli, the sayings of the elders, on proper conduct in the home and out in the world. Other details include an incense bowl, a cooked turkey, and alcoholic pulque. Drinking was restricted to major ceremonies such as weddings, but those hardy enough to reach old age could drink as much as they wanted. It is a fitting scene with which to conclude the Aztec life cycle in the Codex Mendoza. As we continue the subject of picture writing in Mexico, our next episode will go deeper into the ancient Codex traditions of Oaxaca and the Central Highlands, so please join us for it.